everybody. Roger says, hey. We are back with part two of our prelude to World War World World War One <laughs> World War One. Uh, so let's get going. <laughs> All right, super excited to uh, see what part two brings in this. I like that he is taking a different angle than the extra history videos that we watched. So learned uh, some new stuff in part one, but I also learned some new stuff from your comments in part one. So we're going to do comment time and let's take a look at some of them. If you don't want to watch this part, skip to the reaction chapter in this video. It's uh, very it's marked for you, so it's easy for you to find. And. Uh, some uh, dust flying around. Anyway, uh, let's do comment time. Okay, so comment number one is from Thomas Sugg, and he says, Prussia was its own country for hundreds of years, similar to Saxony, Bavaria, and so on. I'm not familiar with them, so... <laughs> Okay, uh, and in 1871, Prussia united uh, all of the German states into the German Empire after the defeat of France. After unification, each German state was still around, they were just under the German Empire. Um, and a lot of you guys try to make the analogy of the United States, how we have 50 states that make up one country, and I do understand that. Like, I understand Germany uh, today is divided into different states. Um, yeah, it's just like... Again, I, I keep I feel like I keep reiterating this, but I just wasn't familiar with like how Germany was broken up at this point in history. Like I know you guys have said that, um, but uh, I I really haven't delved very deeply into it. I just know that what is Germany today used to be like broken up into a bunch of like different uh, ter territory. I'm not even sure what to call them territories because they weren't like countries exactly, but uh, or states really but they were all kind of like under the same culture. So, um, so yeah, Prussia was a thing at this point. I just didn't uh, know in kind of like what state it was a thing. So, um, and Senor uh, Surowatko, <laughs> no, Sur Surowatko. Um, Prussia basically became the core of Germany, its king became uh, Germany's Kaiser, its military tradition became Germany's military tradition, Prussian became a marker of culturally strong institutions in northern Germany. And that kind of like piggybacks on our previous comment where like Prussia is the one that gathered basically all of the different states in unified Germany. So, you know, Prussia, it looks like, was kind of like the main the main part of Germany that kind of like established it and moved everything forward and into what Germany became. So I guess that's good to know. Also, if you hear any weird noises, Scarlet is panting on the bed behind me right now. <laughs> what are you doing? We were just outside uh, playing fetch, so she's uh, cooling off, I guess. Um, General Dreidel says German battleships didn't sit in harbor all the time. This is in response to, I guess, Indian Idell's claim that they did. Uh, they tried to break the British blockade at Jutland and failed despite sinking more British ships than they lost. The blockade did remain intact for the entire war as the Germans realized they had no hope of defeating the Royal Navy. Um, I guess this is also a theme that happened in World War II from what I'm gathering so far in my World at War series that I'm doing over on Patreon. Um, kind of the same same story, it seems like, in, uh, in World War II with the, the navies. Uh, comment number, I don't know, four. Uh, I like this comment. Eduardo uh, Serio? Serio? You were in one of my other, I remember trying to like struggle with your last name before. Um, the Romance languages equal wine, wine Europe, Germanic languages equal beer Europe, and Slavic languages equal vodka Europe. <laughs> it's a very creative uh, way of putting it, but I like that. Um, Hot Stick, with a weird cat face, uh, says, can't believe you're going to be watching this, to be honest there. It's four years of content, so if you're watching one episode a week, you're going to finish this in four years. Uh, yeah. Uh, not that I won't be happy to watch it anyway. So, 
I didn't really think this through. I just kind of like barreled ahead because I was like, I want to watch this series. And wouldn't it be cool to do it and the actual dates and all that stuff? Well, that's already gone out the window because we're already like over a week behind with the dates as far as that goes. Um, and I, I am like chasing some people off with the thought of spending the next four or four and a half years on this series. So I might just like throw the whole like date thing out the window and I still want to like do it, you know, like I want to do all the episodes because um, I just hear it's such a great series and I don't really know much about World War One, so I would like to do it. Sorry, I just ate some almonds and so some of them are like stuck in my throat. <clears> throat> um, so I might uh, again like just abandon the whole like date thing and just maybe we'll try to fit it in in a much shorter amount of time. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, as cool as it would be to do the dates, it is going to be a very long drawn out process. And like I said in my previous video, I don't know even what I'm going to be doing four and a half years from now. Like it would be cool to still be doing this, but at the same time, I feel like a lot of people would just like lose interest you know, at a certain point and just like stop watching. So um, we might try to fit it into a, uh, a much uh, quicker amount of time, which means we do several of these a week. So we'll see. Let me know how that sounds to you guys. I'm not really sure how this is going to go again. Um, Joni, Jody Carter says, you'll be surprised to know the United States had plans to invade the United Kingdom and Canada. I believe Abel by the times of both wars, uh, so they were able to, I guess, by the time of World War One and World War Two, I'm guessing in terms of domestic defensive, at least with uh, Canada. Um, I don't know anything about this, but I did have, this is a Patreon request that somebody asked me to watch on the US plans to invade the UK, at least. And I don't know if they touch on Canada in that video or not. That's gonna be coming in the next uh, few days um, as I try to uh, get some of these Patreon requests out. So I will be watching a video on that and learning about that whole story, but that seems kind of strange to me <laughs> that we were gonna... At least they had plans to do it. I don't know why, but okay. Um, Adurian J says, Roger needs a World War I helmet. Right now he is using the World War II helmet. I do know that uh, this is the World War II helmet the Doughboy helmet of World War One, at least we, that's what we call it over here in the U.S., is very distinctive looking. It's a lot flatter with just a little dome on the top of it. Um, Roger, you're gonna have to get a new hat, buddy. So we'll we'll get him a new hat for um, maybe the next video. Um, and the last comment I have is from Ferno O five six. He or she says. Uh, Celtic is pronounced with a hard C, so Celtic with like a K, uh, linguistic ethnic group, so uh, Cel not Celtic, that's the football team. So <laughs> the reason I pronounced it Celtic was because I think it was one of my previous football videos where I was looking at like the top 10 fans or whatever, there was a team called the Celtics, and I said the Celtics because I thought it was pronounced Celtic, um, but they told me in the comments though it's pronounced Celtic. So when it came to this video, I was like, wait, how am I gonna say this now? Is it Celtic or is it Celtic? Because I've always heard Celtic my entire life, even though we have an NBA team also over here called the Celtics. So I did not realize there was a difference between the linguistic ethnic group called Celtics and then the names of football and basketball teams called the Celtics. So uh, that got me totally confused on how to pronounce the word, but now I understand. When it comes to sports teams, say Celtics. When it comes to like the actual group of people coming from that region of the world, they're called Celtics. All right, and lastly, I uh, didn't have a, a comment for this. I don't know why, I just, uh, I guess didn't come across one when I was looking for this, but I do remember reading um, a lot of your comments you were upset because Indy kept saying England when he meant the UK. So I didn't actually catch that myself. Maybe because I'm an, I'm, an, I'm an American and it didn't stick out as much to me as it would to, um, you know, the Brits living over in the UK. But uh, I'll be kind of looking for that and see if he keeps making that mistake or not. But yeah, I totally didn't even uh, catch that stuff. So 
I mean, hopefully it doesn't make a huge difference. Like, I understood at least what he was talking about, but, um, so hopefully it doesn't make a huge difference to the, like, overall story of this. But yeah, I can get why that might be annoying, so... Anyway, thanks again for your comments. Appreciate you guys, uh, again, helping me learn. Your comments are always a great compliment to these videos, answering my questions. So keep it up and do that for this video too. I'm sure I'll have some questions coming up here. All right, so without further ado, we're gonna go ahead and get into uh, part two. Pretty much said all I wanna say about it. So let's get going. My name is Indy Nidell, and this channel, The Great War, follows World War I week by week, exactly 100 years later. But before we can do that properly, we thought we'd give you a little background on Europe in 1914. I love the okay. graphics. The immediate cause of World War I was the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, which we'll cover in a separate special episode. Today, I'm going to talk a little bit about the cultural hatred and nationalistic fever that led up to his assassination. This was something that was happening all over Europe. Heck, it was happening all over the world, but especially in the Balkans. So let's take a look at the empire of Austria-Hungary and the Balkan nations. Now this empire, even as it still grew, was slowly being torn apart by the tensions of its multi-ethnic states, in particular, the Slavic ones. Now in 1908, Emperor Franz Joseph had formally annexed Bosnia and Herzegovina. Now this annexation inflamed anti-Austrian hatred throughout the Balkans, but especially in Serbia, who were denied the chance of an Adriatic port by Austrian expansion into 375 miles of predominantly Slavic territory. This mm. also gave Austria a base that she could use for any military adventures against Serbia. Now what you have to realize is that the Slavs were split up between Austria, Serbia, Montenegro, and Bulgaria, and most of them dreamed of a pan-Slavic nation. These nations, though, except for Austria, had been not only part of the Ottoman Empire for centuries, but often violently oppressed parts of the Ottoman Empire. And only so, like the Otto Ottoman Empire is again something I don't know anything about, and I've seen it referenced a lot, you know, in a lot of my videos, but I haven't really uh, delved into it to like learn exactly what it was. I I think it's the like kind of like the Turkish, obviously, because it's in modern day Turkey right here. So I think it's like around, you know, like the Turk, like a Turkish empire maybe, but I don't know who's the driving force behind it. I, you know, and I don't know exactly how much, I think it was pretty big from some of the maps I've seen. Um, but yeah, know nothing about it. So again, this is another like huge hole in my historical knowledge that I need to like fill in. ...for centuries, but often violently oppressed parts of the Ottoman Empire, and only recently were they finally able to determine their own fates. So seeing Austria suddenly gobble up new territory with a sizable Slavic population, well, not good. If you look at Serbia in the first decade of the 20th century, here's what you find. First and foremost, a young and proud nation. Serbia had only gained its independence from the Ottoman Empire in 1878, and it was intensely nationalistic. The rest of Europe looked at Serbia suspiciously, though, and its catchphrase, where dwells a Serb, there is Serbia. Well, you can see how that didn't sit well with a lot of people, and let's face it, the only way for Serbia to have united the southern Slav peoples would have been to bring down Austria-Hungary for good, which would have taken a war, which is kind of what happened. Fewer than five million people lived in Serbia, though, so all intentions aside, that wasn't going to happen by itself. However, in the search for allies, Serbia alienated a lot of Europe by the brutal and often violent repression of its own minority peoples, especially Muslims. In much the same way, Serbs and other minorities were repressed by Austria-Hungary. So they didn't get a whole lot of sympathy. And also, endless Balkan violence was nothing new to people. In fact, it was just one of those things that most Europeans were resigned to reading about in the papers from time I to mean, time. I mean, I feel like this is interesting because I feel like that's the way a lot of people feel about the Middle East today is it's just like they're always just going to be fighting with each other. Like, there's nothing we can do about that, right? It's been going on, going on for thousands of years. It's continuing today. Nobody can seem to do anything about it, you know? And so it's just like, I, I, I get what he's saying here because that's how... I think a lot of Westerners, anyway, feel about the Middle East, you know, or at least I can say that's how a lot of Americans feel about it. I don't know about Europe, but 
Yeah, that's that's interesting that there was that still like that same mentality towards the Balkans in uh, in Europe. And I also had the thought in this, and I think I mentioned this in one of my previous videos, it's like amazing to me that World War One started from the Balkan, like the Balkans is what drove World War One, the beginning of it. Um, because again, like not if you don't know anything about World War One, really, you kind of equate it to World War Two in a lot of ways because it's a lot of the same it's fought in the same area, you know? And World War Two was started by Germany, basically more of the Western European nations. And so when you don't really know anything about World War I, you kind of assume that World War I started in kind of the same fashion as World War II, uh, just because of some of the similarities, you know, with it. Um, again, like, I'm, I'm learning that there's less similar between World War I and World War II as I, you know, so I'm learning how all of this started. Obviously, it did not start the same way as World War II. But the assumption, you know, going into it as somebody who doesn't know a whole lot about it, that is the assumption. And so this is kind of like mind-blowing to me that World War I, this huge worldwide war that I tend to associate more with like Western Europe, actually started in the Balkans. In some of these now I know you guys said don't call Austria the small territory or whatever it was this huge empire at the time very powerful in Europe I understand I get that um, but it's uh, I don't know I just coming from the mentality that I did with it again like not knowing um, it just kind of blows my mind that uh, that especially like when you start talking about like these Balkan territories Serbia and, uh, oh gosh, where are some of the, I don't know, so the, so the smaller countries in that area, um, are, are like the, the, um, what do I want to say, epicenter of World War One is, it's just, uh, not what I thought at all, basically, to put it in simplistic terms, it's not what I thought, you know, so I'm having to, like, reframe my entire way uh, thinking about, about World War One, that is this completely other thing than what I had in my head. You know? It's kind of crazy. It was just one of those things that most Europeans were resigned to reading about in the papers from time to time. Another murder, another bombing, in that far off corner of Europe where such things just seem to happen. Right. And regime change was often by murder. Actually, stereotypes aside, the last did happen in 1903. King Alexander and Queen Draga were murdered in their private apartments by a group of young army officers, and their bodies were mutilated. Now, one of the men responsible, Dragutin Dmitrievich, became a national hero when he was wounded by royal guards. He was also known simply as Alpis, and had been a founding member and leader of the Black Hand, who organized the hit on the king and queen. The Black Hand. You just sort of know from the name that these guys aren't going to be devoted to you know, starting soup kitchens or maintaining city parks. Anyhow, by the beginning of the First World War, there were thousands of members of the Black Hand, many of them Serbian army officers and even government officials. And this secret organization did pretty much what you would expect of a terrorist organization. Plan political murders, train and equip guerrillas, and so forth. And they, and Serbian nationalist goals in general, got a big boost in 1912 and 1913, from the two Balkan Wars, which I'm going to tell you about right now. Okay, not right now, because to talk about the Balkan Wars, I first have to talk about the Moroccan crises. Now, there were two of these, one in 1905 and one in 1911, and you can look them up for details. But what they very basically and very generally involved was the Kaiser trying to drive a wedge between England and France, and hopefully even form an alliance between Germany and England. But they succeeded in doing the opposite and made the alliance between France and Britain stronger than ever and drove a deeper wedge between them and Germany. Another result was that France took control of Morocco. Now, at the time, Britain had Egypt, right? So what happens next is very important. Italy saw Ottoman land being seemingly handed out and thought, I gotta get me some of that. So Italy so, went... <clears throat> um, sorry I keep like interrupting. I know some of you guys get annoyed by that, but... Um... So in my previous video, I don't know if it was this one or um, one of the uh, extra history videos, 
But I was like, what in the world happened between uh, Napoleon and now to drive England and France, you know, uh, together as allies? And, um, you know, he just basically answered that question. Some of you guys did in the comments too. It's basically common enemy, right? <laughs> like that's what makes you ally with a, a previous enemy is another common enemy. Um, and, you know, I can point to the US and Britain, you know, we used to, you know, go to war with each other a lot. Well, a lot, a couple of times, I guess, uh, back, you know, back in the day. And uh, now we're like, like the strongest allies, you know, with each other. So it just kind of, because we have, I guess, common enemies, you know, around the world or whatever. It's kind of weird to say enemies, but, you know, common concerns, I guess. Um, I don't like to think of the U.S. as like having enemies around the world because I feel like, you know, we... I know not everybody feels this way about the U.S., but, you know, I like to think of the U.S. as a force for, um, you know, just trying to, like, help maintain the peace around the globe and some safety, you know, and for certain countries and stuff like that. Um, I don't even remember what point I'm trying to make. I guess, yeah, yeah, that's why I don't like talking about enemies, you know, because usually it's just the... Uh, I guess the government of a country that gives us issues and not the people, you know, so um, so I don't really like to think of other countries as being an enemy country, you know, even like places like North Korea, like I don't think of them as enemies, I think of them as a concern, you know, that we have, but um, anyway, uh, yeah, common enemy drives former enemies to be allies, I guess them and Germany. Another result was that France took control of Morocco. Now, at the time, Britain had Egypt, right? So what happens next is very important. Italy saw Ottoman land being seemingly handed out and thought, I gotta get me some of that. So Italy went to war. Now, because of all the Moroccan foolishness, Italy figured correctly that England, France, and Germany would do nothing to stop her. So she attacked the Ottoman Empire. The war lasted less than a month, and Italy successfully took Libya and the dominoes start to fall. The Balkan states, seeing how easily the weakest of the powers could beat the Ottoman Empire, got together and attacked in the First Balkan War. Serbia, Montenegro, Greece, and Bulgaria, with Russian influence, formed the Balkan League, and together succeeded in driving the Ottomans out of the Balkans entirely for the first time in 500 years. It was a big loss for the Ottomans. However, one month after the war, Bulgaria, unsatisfied with the way the conquered territories were split up, turned around and attacked Serbia and Greece. A side note here, Serbia occupied Albania in the Second Balkan War and finally had a seaport of her own. But Austria issued an ultimatum to remove all Serbian forces from Albania within eight days. Serbia complied. Now, as you may guess, this was all a complete mess. And here are some important results. Serbia pretty much doubled her territory in the Balkan Wars, even without Albania. And if you asked a Serb in early 1914, they'd probably say that wars seem to work out pretty well for them, but they pay a terrible price in the end. Between 1912 and 1918, one out of every six Serbs, men, women, and children, would die violently. After the collapse of the Balkan League and Russia's clearly pro-Serbian position in the Second War, Russia was left with only Serbia as an ally in the entire area. And Russia really wouldn't have much choice but to unconditionally support Serbia in 1914. Both Austria-Hungary and Germany were worried by Serbia's growth in both size and stature. And since a lot of German-speaking people saw Serbia as a Russian satellite, well, Austria was ready and willing to put its foot down on Serbian growth and Slavic nationalism. At the same time, after losing a war to Japan in 1905 and being unable to prevent the Bosnian annexation in 1908, the Tsar in Russia was willing and ready to put his foot down to prevent any further loss of face for Russia. And that's where we were in June 1914. All of these sides playing off one against the other and at the epicenter of it all, in the Balkans, an organization that used terrorism and political murder to try and achieve its goals. And then Franz Ferdinand went to Sarajevo. If you missed our Prelude to War special number one, you can click here and watch it right now. Okay, so that was some really, really valuable information because it puts the um, 
the assassination of uh, Archduke Ferdinand and a lot more context for me. Because, like, when, again, like, when you don't understand all of this stuff that he just laid out, um, it sounds pretty ridiculous that one assassination would have, like, kicked off the entire, uh, war. But when you put all of this stuff in context of the ten the tensions for years leading up to it and the diff you know the different attitudes of countries towards each other you know they hate each other whatever uh, all of these land grabs that had been happening for a while these alliances that had to happen like it makes it puts the assassination in. Um, in better context for me and so I understand that that is uh, basically the straw that broke the camel's back you know in, in all of this um, because I feel like when you're just reading textbooks in history class they're like oh it's the assassination that kicked off World War One and that's like all you get <laughs> you know and then you're left kind of like scratching your head like what you know that's literally how I learned World War One in in history class like we covered it but they left out so much information, and so you're just kind of like, okay, so this guy got an assassination and World War I started. Like, that's literally what you get out of it in history class. Um, you know, uh, so it, it's just, like, it's, I'm, I'm glad that these videos exist, you know, because they fill in a lot of information that I feel like you don't get in, in school. At least over here in the U.S., I feel like our curriculum is very, very skimpy on... Um, like we learn world history, but there's so much of it to fit in and we spend a lot of time on American history, you know, as well. So it's kind of like, I don't know, the assassination of Franz Ferdinand got like maybe two paragraphs in the entire textbook, you know, and then they leave out the context with a lot of this other stuff. It's kind of like, you know, how are you supposed to learn this stuff? So, uh, yeah, it's like really interesting to go back and, and think about think about like just how history is taught you know and I was also thinking like it's so helpful to have these maps and stuff that he was kind of like showing where everything happened because like I guess in history class you might have a map or something like that but unless your history teacher is like really good at presenting things visually then they'll probably leave a lot of the map stuff out of it you know and so you're just like reading it in a textbook or listening to them talk about it and nothing's really making sense because you can't visualize where all of this stuff is happening and how things relate to each other and all of this stuff. So, like, I feel like the, the traditional way of teaching history is not very effective. You know, just watch, uh, listening to a lecture, you know, or reading a textbook. Like, I am sure there's some stuff you can get out of that, but being able to see it, like, visually put together in this way and actually seeing real footage of stuff it just brings it to life in a way that helps you understand it just like on a completely different level so uh yes youtube videos don't go super in depth into things you know i've had some people complain you're not going to be able to learn this stuff just watching youtube videos about it well honestly like i've learned a hundred times more watching youtube videos than i ever did reading a textbook in history class so you know, and I'm not saying I, I never got anything out of history class because I did learn some stuff, you know, it did give me some foundational stuff on which to kind of learn more, you know, through this method, but, you know, it's just, I'm really grateful for guys like Indy Idell that took the time to put stuff like this together because it just, like, I feel like the world could be so much better educated now about history than we would have been able to be 10 years, you know, just 10 years ago. So there's no excuse. You've got a ton of information at your fingertips. There's no excuse not to learn this stuff these days. You know, YouTube's free to watch and, you know, you've got some really great content on here on just about anything you want to learn. And, uh, like, it's good to complement or supplement YouTube with you know, other types of documentaries maybe that might not be on here or books even, you can still get a lot out of books. But again, like this is something I made, the point I made in my Napoleon video that I did earlier is like, it's just good to use multiple resources that you have, books, videos, audio lectures, whatever. Um, 
it's good to use these multiple resources to learn all of this stuff because that's where you're going to get the most comprehensive you know education so anyway um really like how Indy is presenting this stuff uh despite maybe a couple of mistakes he might make here or there um it looks like it's going to be a really good series i like the way he explains things and uh yeah, looking forward to uh, part three of this. Uh, maybe Roger will have a new hat at that point, or helmet at that point. Um, but we, uh, we we do want to thank you guys for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe if you haven't done it yet. Check out my links to social media, Discord, Patreon in the description and in my pinned comment. And uh, come back for part three and then we will be getting into the actual uh, war at some, uh, after that. So. It's, it's coming, it's getting close. So we'll see you guys next time.